Hello, and welcome to the History of Rome. Episode 156, Jockeying for Position. When the Emperor Gratian was overthrown and murdered by the General Magnus Maximus in 383 AD, a game of high-stakes political chess kicked off that wound up lasting for five years before checkmate was finally declared. Along the way, the three imperial courts would use every means at their disposal to gain the upper hand, be they diplomatic, religious, or martial. Those of you who have read ahead know how the game turns out. But the five-year quasi-partnership between Maximus, Valentinian II, and Theodosius is a fascinating little period that wound up having profound consequences for the history of the Western world, especially in the always tricky field of church-state relations. Uh, following the execution of Gratian, which was ordered by overzealous subordinates, I swear, Maximus advanced on Trier, took the capital without a fight, and set up an imperial court for himself. With a boy emperor reigning in Milan, and a likely ally in Theodosius reigning in Constantinople, Maximus had good reason to believe that 80% of his work was already done. All he had to do now was co-opt the weak court of Valentinian II and request official recognition from the strong court of Theodosius, and he would be the unchallenged ruler of the Western Empire, QED. So, rather than press on with a military offensive, Maximus chose to instead launch a diplomatic offensive. He would later consider this to be his greatest mistake. When the court in Milan got word of Gratian's death, they decided to send Bishop Ambrose north to Trier to have a chat with Maximus and feel the general out. They knew that as a devout Nicene, Maximus would be willing to listen to what the bishop had to say, rather than just dismissing him out of hand like he might some random official. And the court of Milan needed Maximus to listen to Ambrose, and then keep listening, and then keep listening, long enough to allow them to blockade the Alpine passes into Italy. Ambrose played his part to perfection and stalled for time like a seasoned diplomat. At first, Maximus came out strong and demanded that young Valentinian come north at once as a son comes to his father, believing that the court of Milan had no backbone and that the mere threat of invasion would make them all wilt. Ambrose stalled by saying that it was crazy to expect Valentinian and his mother Justina to make such a journey with winter settling in, but maybe it would be possible in the spring. When Maximus pressed, Ambrose told the general that he did not actually have a mandate to make guarantees of that sort, and that he would have to go back to Milan to receive further instructions. Maximus would have to wait a little while for a formal answer to his demands. Not too much longer, just please be patient. Time successfully bought, Valentinian's generals were able to position troops in the passes, and by the time Maximus realized that the whole thing had been a giant stall, it was too late. He had critically misjudged the loyalty of the Milan court to the house of Valentinian, and any chance he had at a swift and total victory was now gone. Maximus had reason to expect better treatment from Theodosius, but again he was let down. The general's envoys arrived in Constantinople and basically said, Gratian is dead, Maximus is in charge, please sign here. But when these envoys returned to Trier, they did not have with them the specifics of a power-sharing agreement between Theodosius and Maximus, so much as they had, well, nothing at all. Theodosius just ignored their demands. Not even bothering with a response, the Eastern Augustus had decided to just sort of pretend like the whole thing hadn't happened. This left Maximus thoroughly vexed. The imperial officials down in Italy weren't supposed to be closing ranks around a 12-year-old, and his old friend Theodosius wasn't supposed to be giving him the cold shoulder. What the hell was going on around here? Luckily for Maximus, though, Everyone else was pretty much as vexed as he was. All three imperial power centers had enough troops to fend off an attack from one of the others, but none of the three could muster a force large enough to overrun one of the others. 
So Theodosius could refuse to recognize Maximus, but he couldn't yet march into Gaul and displace him. Maximus could hold the western provinces, but he couldn't yet push his way into Italy without a heavy fight. Valentinian could hold the peninsula, but he couldn't do much more beyond that. So, a stalemate set in. Sure, in the spring of 384, Theodosius marched a force toward Illyria, but that was mostly a PR stunt to show that he was doing something about the problem of Maximus. Clearly, though, he never had any intention of crossing the mountains. But that didn't mean that Theodosius was actually doing nothing. In fact, as the emperor headed west for his not very serious photo op, an embassy was headed east on a very serious mission to convince the Sassanids to remain peaceful so Theodosius could turn his full attention to Maximus without worrying about his rear. The leader of this embassy? A senior staff officer of Vandal origin who we will all shortly come to know and love. Stilicho. Meanwhile, back in Italy, Valentinian II's generals were similarly engaged in PR stunts backed by serious behind-the-scenes diplomacy. The Milan court decided that some Alamanni near the border with Raetia posed too great a threat to the empire to be ignored, and so an army was sent into the mountainous province to conduct exercises and make sure the Germans didn't get any funny ideas. But up in Trier, Maximus took those exercises for what he believed they were, which was a show of force directed at him, and he sent envoys down to Milan protesting that these troops were coming dangerously close to violating what he now considered to be his airspace. To which Valentinian's report replied, Hey, those Germans threaten both of us, so quit being so paranoid. This back and forth wound up opening the door for a normalization of relations. Valentinian, in the end, agreed to stay out of Gaul, Britain, and Spain, while Maximus agreed to leave Italy alone for now, and they both agreed to keep an eye on the frontier and defend the empire from mutual barbarian enemies. It is tough to say through all of this what degree of recognition Maximus managed to win for himself, but from here on out, he does seem to have moved beyond unrecognized usurper, and into a more official Augustus status. But whether this was de facto or de jure, or whether or not Theodosius recognized it, remains, at least to me, an open question. Whichever it was, the three sides made no aggressive moves over the next four years, and everyone seemed temporarily satisfied with the power-sharing agreement. But that did not mean that they stopped trying to position themselves for an inevitable showdown. And one of the key flanks everyone was trying to shore up was the religious flank, with Ambrose of Milan once again right smack dab in the middle of everything. At first, it seems a little weird that the emperors would choose this of all moments to begin taking extreme religious positions that undermine social stability, but when viewed in the larger political context, it does begin to make some sense. Both Maximus and Theodosius knew that Ambrose was a huge power broker in Milan, so much of a power broker that he could be seen as something of a kingmaker. With the bishop's support, Maximus might just be able to carry off the West. With the bishop's support, Theodosius might just be able to intertwine the Valentinian and Theodosian families to the point that they became indistinguishable, which meant that Theodosius' sons would be in line to inherit the empire. So, playing to an audience of one, Maximus and Theodosius began to go back and forth in a game of who could be the stronger, more radical defender of the Nicene Creed. Of course, in virtue of having been in power for five years already, Theodosius had a head start. I didn't want to get sidetracked into this when discussing the Gothic War, but in the middle of the conflict, Theodosius decided to stake out a position in the Great Christian War between the Arians and the Nicaeans. By this point in history, the battle lines between the two sides had been drawn, very roughly drawn, between the Latin-speaking West and the Greek-speaking East. 
In the West, a Nicene majority lorded over an Aryan minority, while in the East, these roles were reversed. This meant that when he came to power, Theodosius, born in Spain and a devout Nicene, found himself ruling over the half of the empire that believed the opposite of what he believed. So what did he do? Did he keep religion from becoming a divisive issue by downplaying the doctrinal differences between himself and his subjects? Well, you'd think so, but instead he did the other thing. In early 380, with the Gothic War raging all around him, Theodosius became sick. So sick that he feared for his life and requested a formal baptism. Following this baptism, the emperor suddenly recovered, and it was hard not to draw a connection between the two events. Fueled by a religious certainty that now bordered on fanaticism, when Theodosius entered Constantinople for the first time later in the year, one of the first things he did was depose the Arian bishop of the capital city. He then promulgated a famous edict stating flatly that the emperor considered Nicene Christianity to be the only form of Christianity. Everything else would be considered false and heretical and be against the law. Through the end of the war with the Goths and into the period of stalemate with Maximus, Theodosius endorsed and then backed a systematic program to remove Arian clergymen from church offices and replace them with Nicaeans. This, as you can imagine, did not go over too well with the locals, but for the time being, there was very little they could do. It was one thing to fight the Nicaeans when they were just a collection of rival priests. It was quite another to fight them when they were backed by imperial agents who had, you know, like swords and stuff. Oddly enough, though, Theodosius' religious zeal did not yet extend to paganism, which he treated with a fair degree of tolerance throughout this period. Blood sacrifices were out of the question, of course, but other than that, the remaining pagans in the East did not have to deal with the same kind of treatment doled out by Gratian in the West. And that tolerance would eventually be dropped by Theodosius as a part of his general Make Nice with Ambrose program, following the unpleasantries at Thessalonica in 390, but for now, Theodosius generally left pagans alone. When Maximus came to power in 383 then, he could see that he had some catching up to do if he was going to be perceived by Ambrose as the true great defender of the Nicene Creed. Now the main reason it was so important to be seen as a staunch Nicene was because at that moment, the powerful Ambrose was technically backing an Arian court. The Empress Justina was an Arian, and as a result, her young son Valentinian was too. As we'll see in a second, this led to all kinds of nasty little disputes between the imperial family and the bishop. And because the majority of the population in Milan was Nicene, this meant that it would be pretty easy for Ambrose to use these disputes to drive a huge wedge between the imperial family and the citizens of Milan, if he were so inclined. Maximus figured that if he could prove his Nicene bona fides, eventually Ambrose might get sick of supporting those damned heretics in the imperial palace and throw his weight behind the Nicene usurper up in Trier. In an effort to win over Ambrose's support, Maximus decided to do Theodosius' Nicene extremism one better. But there weren't really any Arian clergy he could expel from office, since his provinces didn't really have too many Arian clergymen. But there were heretical communities out there just waiting to be persecuted. But without patronage to cut off or lands to confiscate, there was really only one method of persecution left. Sometime between 384 and 386, a bishop from the Iberian Peninsula named Priscillian wound up in a heated theological fight with the mainstream Nicene surrounding him. After most of his allies in the church were deposed, Priscillian wound up appealing directly to Maximus for aid. To the great surprise of the heretical bishop, Maximus decided to hear the appeal, and then deny the appeal, and then hand down a little divine justice. 
Priscillian and six of his followers were arrested and then beheaded. It was the first recorded case of an execution on charges of heresy in history, though technically I think he was brought up on charges of practicing magic. And it was also the first recorded case of the state handing down a death sentence to resolve a church dispute. But though it earned him an ignoble place in history, the move kind of backfired on Maximus, as Ambrose harshly condemned the executions. Because it was wrong to kill over doctrinal disputes? Well, no. Ambrose opposed the executions on the grounds that Maximus had strayed out of his jurisdiction. Church matters should be solved by the church. Maximus had no right to interfere. The business with Priscillian just so happened to occur right after Ambrose's second trip to Trier in 385, when he went to see about retrieving Gratian's body so that it could be properly buried. But this time around, Ambrose had been met by a slightly more hostile version of Maximus. Yes, he was courting the Nicaeans generally, and yes, he badly wanted Ambrose's support specifically. But that did not stop the general from taking the opportunity to angrily come down on Ambrose for bargaining in bad faith the last time around. Convinced that the bishop stalling had cost him his best chance at total victory, Maximus refused to release Gratian's body, and Ambrose wound up heading home empty-handed. It is entirely possible that fallout from this summit was behind Ambrose's later condemnation of the execution of Priscillian, though Ambrose did not really need an ulterior motive to argue that emperors had no business messing with church affairs. His belief in that principle is well documented. Part of that well documentation came shortly thereafter in 386, and is the famous incident at the Portion Basilica. During his years as bishop, Ambrose so completely put his Nicene stamp on Milan that by the mid-380s, the Arian minority in the city, including the Empress Justina and the Emperor Valentinian II, literally had no place to worship. Ambrose allowed not a single church in the city to preach anything resembling that heretical Arian nonsense. This, of course, greatly annoyed the Empress, and so in 386, she asked for a small measure of consideration. She asked Ambrose to give the Arians one church in the city center and one church out in the suburbs so that her and her doctrinal brethren could worship in peace. Ambrose, of course, flatly refused. So what if the request was coming directly from the emperor? Arianism was heresy and wasn't going to get a platform so long as Ambrose was bishop of Milan. So then a Praetorian prefect came round to talk sensibly with Ambrose and said, look, maybe just give her the one in the suburbs, the so-called Portion Basilica. That would be all right, wouldn't it? But again, Ambrose refused. This annoyed the Empress so much that she had Valentinian order a contingent of house guards down to the basilica in question to just take it by force. These guards entered the church and began hanging up Arian decorations in preparation for an Arian Easter service when word got out of what was happening. Pretty soon Ambrose's Nicene congregation showed up at the scene and began violently agitating against the occupation of the church. Then a small group of them pushed their way in, pushed out the guards, and blockaded the door. So now we have a full-blown situation. Ambrose himself stayed away from the scene, but made it known that he fully supported the expulsion of the Arians. Various imperial officials, knowing full well that Ambrose could put a stop to it all if he wanted to, came around to broker a deal, but the bishop refused to compromise. Eventually, with a hostile mob overwhelming the outnumbered imperial troops, Justina relented and ordered her men to withdraw. The Bishop of Milan had just stared down the Empress and won. I imagine that his success on that day bolstered his confidence to the point that when the time came, he felt no fear about getting into a staring contest with an emperor. And not a boy emperor like Valentinian II or a malleable young emperor like Gratian, but a fully established soldier emperor like Theodosius, who had just won a civil war 
making him the last sole ruler of the Roman Empire. There is a Spanish word for what Ambrose had, and that word is cojones. While these religious controversies swirled, the three imperial centers of the empire continued to maneuver around one another politically. Maximus kept working toward full recognition. Valentinian II, or at least the high officials of his court, kept working to maintain their independence in the face not only of the threat posed by Maximus in the north, but also the threat by Theodosius. At any moment, the eastern Augustus might decide to step in and declare himself the protector of Valentinian II, which would be nothing more than a polite way of saying that Valentinian's days as an independent emperor were over. In the east, meanwhile, Theodosius kept working methodically to ensure the stability and safety of his provinces so that he could go face down Maximus properly. He had not yet answered definitively the question of recognition of Maximus or civil war with Maximus, but it was pretty clear that he wanted civil war with Maximus. In 386, though, Maximus' hope that Theodosius would wind up choosing recognition was raised by the appearance on the north bank of the Danube of an armed force of Grutungi Goths. In a scene eerily reminiscent of the events of 376, the Grutungi were demanding that they be allowed to settle in Roman territory, just as their cousins had been allowed to settle a few years before. With said cousins already causing formidable administrative and security headaches for Theodosius, though, the thought of even more Goths settling in the empire drove the emperor to fits. He was over dealing with Goths, so completely over the Goths. And so he came up with a rather brutal solution. The Grutungai petitioners were told that they would indeed be allowed to settle in the empire. But once they were in their rafts and crossing over the river, surprise, the imperial fleet manning the Danube suddenly attacked. The Goths were surrounded and then slaughtered. So completely over dealing with Goths. In 387, Maximus's hope for recognition was dashed for good when Roman ambassadors returned from a final round of talks with the Sassanids, treaty in hand. I haven't been able to find a good way to slip this bit in yet, so I'm just going to sort of wedge it in right now. But the Persian king the Roman ambassadors dealt with now was Shapur III, rather than that old, implacable enemy of the Romans, Shapur II. Sadly, Shapur the Great finally died in 379 AD, after a remarkable 70-year reign over his empire. Which you'd think would be some kind of record, but history is apparently full of monarchs who reigned for 70-plus years, Louis XIV and his 72 years running France among them. The record for longest verified reign, because I know you're just dying for me to tell you this, goes to Sabuza II, king of Swaziland, who reigned 82 years, 254 days, between 1899 and 1982. The record for longest unverified reign goes to the Egyptian Pepi II, an old kingdom pharaoh who reigned 94 years between 2278 and 2184 BC. Good job, guys. Anyway, I note the passing of Shapur II because, man, that guy has been an on-again, off-again boogeyman of the Romans since he was first provoked by Constantine the Great way back in 336. He rightfully deserves his place in the pantheon of all-time great enemies of the Roman Empire, and may he rest in peace. So the ambassadors returned with a bad deal for Rome, but a good deal for Theodosius right at that moment. The Romans agreed to cede four-fifths of Armenia to Sassanid control in exchange for peace. The deal may have been a crappy one, but it gave Theodosius the peace he wanted, and it broke the imperial stalemate that had defined the empire for five years. Theodosius was now free to move on Maximus, and everyone knew it, which changed the whole equation. As soon as he found out about the deal, 
Maximus knew he could no longer afford to sit back and hope for a peaceful resolution. So, near the end of 387, he mobilized his forces and drove them south into Italy, blowing through the garrisons protecting the Alpine passes. Valentinian's advisors determined that Maximus's army was too strong and coming too fast for them to fight back, so they packed up and fled for the protection of Theodosius's court. There was still a lingering fear that Theodosius might take this opportunity to essentially depose young Valentinian, but that was a risk they were going to have to take. Next week, we will see that their fears were misguided. Far from wanting to depose Valentinian, Theodosius will demand that the two emperors be bound together even closer than ever. Yes, Theodosius had his eye on the next generation and wanted to ensure a clear path for his own sons to inherit the empire. But for now, he really would be the protector that Valentinian needed. Right now, it was time for war with Maximus. Hello, and welcome to the History of Rome. Episode 157, Only the Penitent Man Shall Pass. In late 387 AD, the 12-year-old Emperor Valentinian II, his mother Justina, and the rest of the Milan court showed up in Thessalonica begging Theodosius for asylum. The Eastern Augustus, aware that his brother Emperor had been put to flight by the usurper Maximus, had traveled down to the port city in advance and received the exile court with open arms, promising to do everything he could to restore Valentinian to power. But not just out of the goodness of his heart. The price for Theodosius's help was the hand of Valentinian's sister Gala in marriage. The Eastern Augustus's first wife, Elia Flacilla, mother of the two future emperors, Arcadius and Honorius, had died in 385, and Theodosius was looking for a marital alliance that would bind his clan to the Valentinians, forming a single intertwined dynasty. The price seemed reasonable enough to the Empress Justina, and the marriage was hastily arranged. Emerging from the wedding ceremony as a single political unit, the Theodosian-Valentinian dynasty then prepared for war. Maximus had timed his attack on Italy perfectly, waiting until the last minute before winter sent in to pounce. By the time Theodosius learned of the attack, it was too late in the year for the Eastern Augustus to do anything about it. He would have to wait until spring, which meant that Maximus had bought himself six months to get his house in order and ready his troops for an inevitable counterattack. The general had already laid the groundwork for defending Italy during his initial invasion, as it is assumed that bribery and induced defections had been the main reason he had penetrated the Alpine passes so easily. When these Italian forces were combined with his Gallic legions, Maximus's army was, at least on paper, equal to just about anything Theodosius would be able to put in the field. After all, we are still just a few years removed from the devastating Gothic War. It's not like the legions of the Middle Empire had a lot of men to spare for a civil war. But Theodosius had been laying some groundwork of his own. We saw last week how the peace treaty with the Sassanids freed up at least some Syrian border troops for the campaign. But the Eastern Augustus' main source of recruits for the coming civil war would actually come from the ranks of the very barbarians he had spent his first few years in office fighting. In these turbulent times, alliances were formed, broken, and reformed with dizzying speed. Theodosius had not stopped working after successfully bringing an end to the Gothic War with a combination of attrition and diplomacy, and throughout the mid-380s, he continued to focus his attention on winning over as many barbarians as he possibly could to his side. And that did not just mean Goths. 
That meant factions of Huns and Alans from beyond the Danube frontier who were more than willing to sell their cavalries into imperial service if the price was right. Nothing about the armed conflicts of late antiquity make them easy to paint in stark black and white terms. And the war that is about to break out between Theodosius and Maximus is a great example of why it's so hard. Theodosius' top field generals, Ricomers, the general who had come east at the outset of the Gothic War, and Ricomers' nephew Arbogast, were both ethnic Franks from the Lower Rhine. They would be leading a mixed band of Roman legionaries drawn from the Danube provinces, Gothic auxiliaries called up according to the terms of their settlement agreement, and Hun and Alon mercenaries who were paid to serve as Theodosius's cavalry arm. They would be fighting against Maximus, who hailed from the same region of Spain as Theodosius, but whose army consisted mostly of Gallic legionaries, who were basically just ethnic Germans living on the west side of the Rhine, and Alamanni auxiliaries, who answered Maximus's call to arms after years of friendly patronage from the general. In other words, when looked at from a few miles up, this Roman civil war resembles nothing so much as a giant squabble between rival barbarian tribes. Take out Maximus and Theodosius, and really, how many Romans in this Roman civil war are left? Not many, I can tell you that. When spring came, Theodosius went on the offensive and ordered a two-pronged assault on the Italian peninsula. Ground forces would march west through the Alps, while a naval force would simultaneously sail up the Adriatic and attack by sea. Maximus, using Aquileia as his base of operations, worked quickly to counter both threats, pulling a force down to deal with the naval invasion, while directing the bulk of his forces to block up the mountain passes. But unfortunately for Maximus, the winter had worked both ways, and he too had been forced to wait until spring to make many of these moves. So, when an advanced guard of his army occupied the small city of Siscia in what is now Slovenia, they were unable to complete the defensive fortifications necessary to hold Theodosius off. With the lightning-fast Hun cavalry leading the way, Theodosius' land army made contact with Maximus' forces at Siscia and easily ran them off. But this was just the opening skirmish. The real test would come a hundred miles to the north in the fortified city of Poetovio, where Maximus' main army, led in person by his brother, was stationed. Details are scarce, but it appears the two sides met in battle in midsummer 388, and after an intensely fought back and forth battle, Theodosius emerged victorious. With his armies guarding the mountains defeated, and his southern flank failing in the face of the naval assault, Maximus called for reinforcements from the north, and then fled back to Aquileia to await relief. But with Theodosius's forces breathing down Italy's neck, the powers that be in Aquileia decided that standing behind Maximus was suicide, whereas handing him over likely meant they would escape all this with their heads intact. So, they thought it over for roughly two nanoseconds and put Maximus in chains. When Theodosius's forces arrived, Maximus was handed over, and on August 28, 388 AD, General was beheaded. I'll never quite be sure what his official title was, but he did rule the western provinces for five years and by all accounts did a pretty good job. And now he's dead, so there you go. With Maximus dead, Theodosius entered Milan unopposed and then called on Valentinian and the rest of his exile court to return. The war over, securing the peace was now the main task confronting the victorious Theodosius, and, as in his dealings with the Goths, the Eastern Augustus demonstrated that he found clemency and forgiveness far superior tools to work with than hostility and revenge. Almost no punitive action was taken against the men who had sided with Maximus, and even within the general's own family, only his eldest son, who had been named Maximus's official co-ruler and successor, paid the ultimate price for the general's transgressions. His wife and daughters were allowed to live out their lives in peace, with their security guaranteed. 
As Julius Caesar had shown so many years before, this sort of habitual blanket clemency can sometimes come back to bite you. But Theodosius likely felt like the alternative would have been far worse. It's not like Maximus had been unpopular with either the people or the military. Going after his supporters would have meant, well, going after everyone, really. Better to risk some reignited revolt later on than guarantee one now by coming down too harshly. Aside from the people and the soldiers of the West, there was one other major player that Theodosius was keen to placate, the Bishop of Milan. Ambrose had stayed behind when the imperial court had abandoned the Italian capital to Maximus, and his steadfast refusal to be pushed around had elevated his popularity, and he was already pretty popular, into the stratosphere. Not that staying took some immense amount of courage or anything. If Ambrose felt he had a thing to fear from the devoutly Nicene Maximus, he probably would have hightailed it out of there. But he didn't, and so he didn't. Theodosius understood that the road to a secure Western Empire went right through the bishop's church, and so he reached out to Ambrose in an attempt to bring the influential clergyman over to his side. But Theodosius was about to discover that Ambrose was the kind of man who, while willing to make deals, was only willing to make them on his own terms. Thoroughly empowered and not at all impressed by imperial displays of power, Ambrose had no intention of compromising with Theodosius on anything. The emperor was going to have to come to him. Theodosius caught his first whiff of Ambrose's willingness to go head-to-head -head with an imperial court when news came that far in the east, some fanatical monks had talked themselves up into a righteous fury and then decided to go take that fury out on an ancient Jewish synagogue. Theodosius, you'll recall, usually reserved his own religious fanaticism for intra-Christian conflicts and skewed tolerant when other religions were involved. When he learned of the monks' crime, the emperor ordered them to pay to have the synagogue rebuilt. It seemed like this was a routine bit of law and order. Private property had been destroyed, everyone knew who had done it, and so the vandals, not that we can really call them that yet, ought to pay for the repairs. Okay, what's next? So Theodosius was shocked when Ambrose took to his pulpit and denounced the emperor's decision in extremely harsh language. Taken aback by the assault, the emperor modified his decision, ordering the whole civic community in question to help rebuild the synagogue, rather than focusing solely on the monks. But Ambrose continued to take offense, asking his congregation why a single public dollar should go toward building a temple for sacrilegious Jews, and then asking further, hey, you know, why aren't we giving that money to the monks as a reward for the good work that they've done? Theodosius was shocked by the bishops demagoguing on the issue, but with the people of Milan raised up now into a mighty rabble, the emperor decided to just cut bait. The order to rebuild the synagogue was quietly dropped. Ambrose had once again stared down the imperial court and won, but his best was still to come. Despite the shot that Ambrose had just fired across his bow, Theodosius was not ready to become an anti-all-other-religions kind of Christian just yet. In June of 389, he traveled down to Rome to secure the support of the old Roman Senate, and flashing around a bunch of extremist Christian rhetoric wasn't going to get him anywhere. Instead, he engaged in a very low-key charm offensive designed to set the senators' minds at ease. While in the city, he made a habit of dropping the most ostentatious bits of his imperial regalia and leave behind his military escorts when he called on senators at their homes. For a brief moment there, Theodosius seemed to return to the princeps model and presented himself as a man, a leader, and an honorable soldier, rather than a warlord and a living god. The charm offensive did the trick, and the Senate fell over itself praising Theodosius and promising their complete support. The emperor's reasonable front was so comforting that the great senator Symmachus even took the opportunity to ask that the sacred altar of victory be restored, but that went a little too far, and Theodosius firmly, though politely, 
refused. These happy times would not last, however, as events were about to overtake them all, giving Ambrose the leverage he needed to really bend the emperor over the cross. The bishop had been chafing a little bit since Theodosius' arrival in Italy, because while the emperor clearly desired an alliance with the Church of Milan, he was not proving nearly as pliable as Gratian nor Valentinian II. The young emperors had been more than willing to bring Ambrose in on their inner circle discussions of policy, making the bishop practically a minister of state. But Theodosius had his own inner circle of advisors, and ever since the defeat of Maximus, Ambrose had found himself on the outside looking in, hence the need to take to the pulpit on the synagogue question, rather than just saying in a meeting, no, we won't be doing that. Sure, he had spies all over Theodosius' court and was kept fully briefed on what was going on, but he had lost the direct power he'd enjoyed for the last decade. The bishop didn't want to simply be an ally of the imperial court. He wanted to be indistinguishable from it. And so what he needed was a way to drive himself back into the center of the action. In 390, Theodosius's temper got the better of him, and Ambrose immediately recognized the resulting PR debacle as the opportunity he had been looking for. The citizens of the key port city of Thessalonica, like most of the citizens of the empire, loved chariot racing. And I mean loved chariot racing. I'm not sure there is any modern sport, football included, that quite touches the salivating obsession exhibited by chariot racing fans in late antiquity. Part of it was because racing was essentially the only sport going. They didn't have dozens of options to choose from, so if you were the type of person who was into the thrill of competition, rooting for one team, hating another team, or had any interest at all in gambling, well, then chariot racing was going to be your thing. Your only thing. So one day, the biggest chariot racing star in Thessalonica gets arrested on what amounts to charges of homosexual rape. Locked up in a cell, he is now going to miss the big race, which causes the good citizens of Thessalonica to go a little crazy. Now, there was definitely more going on here than just the loss of a big star on race day. Since heading west, Theodosius had left the city garrison by a small contingent of allied Gothic soldiers, which did not sit well with the public, and it was the Gothic captain of this Gothic garrison who was behind the arrest, which really did not sit well with the public. In their book, Theodosius and the Empire at Bay, Stephen Williams and Gerald Friel point out that this meant there were really three factors behind the coming riots at Thessalonica. First was general resentment over the presence of Gothic soldiers in the city. Sure, at the top levels, alliances shifted with the winds these days, but down on the mass level, well, hadn't the Goths just been rampaging through our lands like just the other day? Wounds did not heal as quickly down here as they did in the corridors of power. Second was the temperamental difference between the Greeks and the Goths when it came to the question of homosexuality. The former had no real problem with it, while the latter considered it a fairly heinous offense. Locking up a star charioteer for homosexual activity, then, was an obnoxious imposition of barbarian sensibility on Greek manners, and now doubly so, given the circumstances. The third factor was that well, yeah, they were all pissed that the charioteer was going to be sitting in a cell on race day. The people of Thessalonica began to get hostile, and pretty soon a riot broke out. The Gothic garrison wasn't nearly strong enough to get a handle on the mob, and they were quickly overrun. The Gothic captain behind the arrest and most of his fellow officers were tracked down, killed, and their bodies dragged through the streets. News quickly reached Theodosius in Milan about what had happened, and he exploded with rage. The Gothic captain had been a trusted and loyal officer, as evidenced by the fact that he had been given command over the key city of Thessalonica, and his murder by some race-crazed mob made Theodosius furious. Murderously furious. 
Before he could sleep on his anger, he sent orders off to the commander of the new and large garrison being brought in in the wake of the riot. The orders were as clear as they were evil. When the citizens of Thessalonica next filled up their hippodrome for a big race, the new garrison came down, locked all the doors, and then marched out into the crowd, swords drawn. Theodosius's orders had been plain. Indiscriminate slaughter. The troops did their bloody work efficiently, and pretty soon over 7,000 men, women, and children were dead. Even in the callous days of late antiquity, a time when life was cheap, the massacre of Thessalonica appalled the citizens of the empire. Even Theodosius understood that he had gone too far, which is why, after sending out his initial order, he sent out another countermanding it, which of course arrived too late, which meant that the emperor, author of the massacre, wound up as appalled as anyone that it had actually taken place. When Ambrose learned of what had happened, he immediately pulled up stakes and left Milan for the countryside to consider his next move. The bishop knew that the emperor had just committed a grievous sin, that the emperor furthermore was a religious man, and that that meant that Ambrose had an opportunity to leverage the emperor's guilt into something profitable. But rather than climb back up onto his bully pulpit, Ambrose was savvy enough to try a different tactic. He wrote the emperor a personal letter, saying that unfortunately he would be unable to celebrate Mass with Theodosius present until the emperor had publicly atoned for his sin. Ambrose was careful to say that he was not angry at the emperor, and that this was not a punishment, instead saying that he was only doing what had to be done, and that he was in anguish over the damage it might cause to Theodosius' soul. When Ambrose returned to Milan, Theodosius tried to call the bishop's bluff, but when he approached Ambrose's church, the bishop held fast, refusing the emperor entry. The honestly Christian Theodosius allowed himself to be turned away, and then proceeded to go into seclusion, remorseful over what he had done, and now deeply concerned over the fate of his immortal soul. He kept up a personal correspondence with Ambrose, where the bishop again pressed him to publicly atone for his sin. How exactly the emperor might do this was unclear, but eventually Theodosius settled on a path that might lead him to forgiveness. Leaving his imperial finery behind, Theodosius came down to Ambrose's church and proceeded to spend the next few months engaged in a mixture of prayer and groveling. As fall turned to winter 390, the emperor's running display of fealty to the church finally convinced Ambrose that Theodosius could now be forgiven in the eyes of the Lord. I'm sure that the imperial promise to adopt stricter anti-pagan policies had nothing at all to do with Ambrose finally deciding to save Theodosius' soul from its impending doom. The showdown between Theodosius and Ambrose was a watershed moment for church-state relations. There had been conflicts between the two before, but up until this point, the state had always had the upper hand. Constantine had been deferential in his handling of the Christians, but there was never any doubt that when push came to shove, the emperor was in charge. Here now was an incident where an emperor said, I want X. The church said, you cannot have X. And the church, amazingly, won out. As I said when I introduced Ambrose, had it not been for the bishop's kind of insane degree of self-confidence, it is possible that the Christian church would have remained forever the junior partner in the church-state alliance. But Ambrose's resolve laid an enormously important precedent. Emperors and kings had power on earth, but the church controlled the fate of the soul. Now it should be noted that Theodosius's religious temperament played its own critical part in the laying of this precedent. Had he been the kind of ruler who only paid lip service to Christianity, it would not be hard to picture him simply tossing Ambrose out on his butt and installing a more agreeable bishop in his place. But Theodosius appears to have believed in Ambrose's power as God's representative on earth, and it was this belief that proved decisive during the showdown over the Thessalonica massacre. Now, 
Did this mean that every subsequent temporal ruler would now feel obligated to bow to the church? Not by a long shot. But it did mean that some of them would. That in the coming conflicts between church and state, that the church would have some firepower in their arsenal when they demanded fealty from the kings, and an example that they could follow should they ever feel as bold as Ambrose and decide to follow it. Just ask Henry IV, who was presently standing barefoot in the snow outside the gates of Canossa. Following his return to the church in early 391, Theodosius, full of newfound Christian vigor, turned away from his previous policy of toleration and published a famous edict effectively banning paganism in the empire. This edict was not unlike previous edicts banning paganism in the empire, so it is not quite the revolutionary piece of legislation it is often supposed to be. But given the times, the influence of Ambrose, and the personal Christian piety of Theodosius, the edict wound up having more teeth than any of its predecessors. In Egypt, for example, a fanatical bishop named Theophilus seized on the edict as an opportunity to destroy the five-century-old Serapium of Alexandria, one of the largest and greatest temples of the pagan world. When the Serapium fell, the last remaining portion of the Library of Alexandria fell with it, and the world's eyes turned to see how Theodosius would react. The emperor did nothing, signaling to Christian extremists that in their war against paganism, the gloves could now really come off. In the summer of 391, Theodosius decided that perhaps it was time for him to be leaving Milan. Technically, he and Valentinian still adhered to the east-west power-sharing system, and Theodosius's stay in Italy was always meant to be temporary. It was time for the eastern Augustus to return to the eastern provinces, where he belonged. But Theodosius, clearly the senior Augustus in all but name, had no intention of just leaving Valentinian to his own devices. Now 15, the boy still needed a guardian, and the western provinces still needed a strong hand to protect them. So Theodosius installed his old, loyal Frankish general Arbogast to act as the master of Valentinian's armed forces. Not only did Theodosius have complete confidence in Arbogast's ability as a soldier, but he also had complete confidence in Arbogast's ultimate loyalty to him rather than young Valentinian, something which might prove useful someday down the road. Plus, as a Frank, Arbogast was not eligible to ever become emperor himself, so Theodosius would not have to worry about some Maximus-esque usurpation going on. It all added up to the same thing. Leaving Arbogast in charge of the military meant Theodosius would never again have to worry about marching west to fight a civil war. Next week, you guessed it, less than a year after heading back to Constantinople, Valentinian II will be dead, Arbogast will be in revolt, and Theodosius will once again find himself marching west to fight a civil war. Hello, and welcome to the History of Rome, Episode 158, An Imperial Suicide. So, yeah, sorry about last week. I forgot to leave time in my schedule for an emergency appendectomy, so the show had to be tabled. I'm sure this came as a disappointment, but as many of you noted, had this been Roman times, I'd probably be dead right now so I suppose we should all just count our blessings. I'd personally like to thank the fine people at Seton Medical Center in Austin, Texas, for taking me apart and putting me back together so efficiently. And without further ado, let's get back into this thing. Though I'd like to apologize in advance for this episode being a little shorter than usual, I'm not really back to 100% strength just yet, and decided to scale back my ambitions a bit 
rather than pushing forward too hard, too fast. Okay, so where the heck were we? Ah, yes. Theodosius had just finished doing his penance for ordering the massacre at Thessalonica, and in the early summer 391 had decided it was time to head back to Constantinople. Left behind to govern the western provinces was the now 20-year-old Valentinian II, who had, for a few years now, technically been the senior Augustus of the empire, although he had never even once been treated as such. Even now, totally old enough to be ruling in his own right, Valentinian was still treated as the same powerless figurehead that he'd been treated as his whole life. Only now, rather than being dominated by Justina and Ambrose, a new puppet master stepped forward to take over the imperial strings. Arbogast, a Frankish general appointed by Theodosius to command the armies of the West. The general took his role as protector of the western provinces seriously, and took Valentinian's role as emperor not very seriously at all. It is possible that Justina may have been able to act as a check on Arbogast's growing power, but at some point, either just before or just after Theodosius left Milan, the empress died, leaving her son to fend for himself, and he would not fend very well at all. The first thing Arbogast did was move the imperial court up to Trier, where he would have a better vantage point from which to survey the Rhine frontier. Various Germanic tribes, including members of Arbogast's own Frankish communities, had taken the opportunity of Maximus's revolt and the subsequent lack of an imperial presence in the region to raid into the Roman provinces and make off with as much as they could. Despite the general's connection to the tribes of the Lower Rhine, they had overstepped the bounds of propriety and needed to be punished. So for the rest of 391, Arbogast led a campaign against his erstwhile people and by all accounts whipped them back into place pretty quick. This battlefield success led to Arbogast's growing sense of entitlement, and his ego began to run away with him. Although, it's not like he didn't have good reason to be arrogant. Here he was, a seasoned and decorated general, personally appointed by Theodosius to run the military of the entire Western Empire. He had proven his loyalty, proven his worth, and probably felt like he had earned the free hand he was now assuming he had. And besides, what was his alternative? To pay attention to the opinions of some untested youth who had been dominated for the last decade by a woman and a priest? Beyond doing whatever he felt like doing whenever he felt like doing it when it came to military matters, Arbogast started appointing his own ministers to various bureaucratic positions without consulting the emperor, and then giving those ministers the authority to overrule decisions made by Valentinian's appointed ministers. But despite his growing autonomy, at no point does it appear that Arbogast intended to overthrow the young emperor, because what would have been the point of that? The general had all the power and prestige he could ever hope for, without worrying that a strong imperial hand would check that power and prestige. I would imagine that Arbogast was quite pleased with the arrangement as it now stood. Valentinian, on the other hand, could not have been more miserable. As I mentioned, he was now 20 years old and had every right to believe that with his mother dead, Ambrose back in Milan, and a new commander-in-chief in place, that it was time for him to assume more responsibility. But the way Arbogast was treating him made it painfully clear that that was never going to happen. Valentinian would issue orders, and they would be ignored. He would appoint ministers, and they would be overruled. He would announce a new policy, and the people would look to Arbogast, to see if they really needed to follow it. Throughout 391 and into 392, the increasingly despondent Valentinian wrote letters to Theodosius complaining about his treatment, but Theodosius was likely as happy with the political arrangement in the West as Arbogast was. Ruling an empire was serious business. Nobody wanted the inexperienced Valentinian screwing things up, and so the young emperor was left to languish in his impotent isolation. Had he played his hand a little smarter, Arbogast might have been able to maintain this dynamic more or less indefinitely. He had Theodosius' full support, and Valentinian had, 
well, no one's full support. But unfortunately, Arbogast lacked the silver tongue necessary to successfully pull the strings of a puppet emperor. See, you have to stroke the ego of the puppet. You have to pretend like the puppet is really in charge. You have to convince the puppet that those strings attached to its hands are just a trick of the light. Your words have to be manipulative, and your actions have to come with a veneer of servitude. But Arbogast was no sneaky courtier. He was a blunt soldier, and he had no time for such shenanigans. He was the real power in the West, not Valentinian, and he was damn well going to act like it. So the emperor was dismissed, ignored, and mocked, rather than endured, placated, and soothed, which would prove to be Arbogast's undoing. After a year spent in lavish purgatory, Valentinian II had finally had enough. He was the emperor, not Arbogast, and it was time to make that point clear to everyone. In May of 392, Valentinian sent a letter to the Frankish general, dismissing him from his post. But when Arbogast received the note, he laughed his head off and then sent his own note back. Dear Valentinian, Theodosius appointed me to my position, not you. You have no authority to fire me. Sit on it. Sincerely, Arbogast. Valentinian was incensed, but when he looked around, he realized that there was nothing he could do about it. No one was going to go to the mat for him. No one was going to take his side against the general. He really was just a powerless figurehead. A few days later, Valentinian's body was discovered in his private bedchamber. The emperor had hanged himself. He was 21 years old and had been nothing more than a figurehead emperor for 17 years. The suicide put Arbogast in a tight spot, since it would naturally raise eyebrows all over the empire. Suicide. Right. Suicide. Whatever you say, Arbogast. Sure must be nice to have that troublesome youth out of your way, though, right? Nudge, nudge. Wink, wink. However, though assassination is, of course, a possibility, the historical consensus seems to be that Valentinian really did hang himself. The emperor's death benefited Arbogast in no clear way, and the general's actions in the months that followed show no indication that he had committed murder most foul. If Arbogast killed the emperor as part of a coup, it was the worst-run coup in history since he did not seize power for himself, the way that, say, Maximus had after killing Gratian, nor did he immediately put some hand-picked successor on the throne, the way that, say, Pertinax had been elevated after the murder of Commodus. If he was playing a really long con and waiting for Theodosius to announce a successor, then... What? He was hoping for someone even weaker than Valentinian? I'm not sure how much weaker than Valentinian you can really get. So the consensus is that maybe Arbogast killed the emperor, but if he did, it was a really, really dumb idea. Though, I suppose that's not necessarily an airtight alibi, given the infinite stupidity of man. A word of Valentinian's death and Arbogast's protestations of innocence arrived in Constantinople at almost the same time. Theodosius was likely inclined to believe his general, but the people surrounding Theodosius had other ideas. Valentinian's sister and Theodosius' wife, Gala, refused to believe the suicide story and raised holy hell about the need to revenge the murder of her brother. Then there was the Praetorian prefect Rufinus, who, no friend of Arbogast, did his best to control the flow of information so that the Frankish general would be painted in as bad a light as possible. For months, then, the eastern court hemmed and hawed about what to do. Do we accuse Arbogast of murder and risk civil war, let him off the hook and risk letting a man guilty of regicide walk free? Finally, in late August, Arbogast got sick of waiting for a decision and decided that the government of the West needed an emperor. As a Frank, he knew that he personally couldn't fill the role, so Arbogast plucked up Flavius Eugenius, a former teacher of rhetoric and now second-tier imperial secretary, and hailed him Augustus of the West. 
The choice of Eugenius was a surprise, but it does hint that Arbogast understood that he had probably fallen out of favor in the east and that he needed to find some new allies if he was going to survive. Eugenius may have been a lower-ranking minister, but he had very close ties to the old Roman aristocracy, and it was likely those ties that Arbogast had his eyes on. Should the need arise, the general would now be able to raise funds from the senatorial elite, who, conveniently enough, now hated Theodosius to a man because the emperor had turned into an anti-pagan extremist following his reconciliation with Ambrose. Arbogast was not ready to break with Theodosius just yet, but clearly he was hedging his bets. Upon his ascension, Eugenius sent ambassadors to the eastern court to ask for formal recognition. The West needed an emperor. Theodosius had not immediately provided one, so the West had been forced to take matters into its own hands. This was not about usurpation. It was about political necessity. So, please, ratify my elevation. Theodosius and his ministers were as non-committal with Eugenius' ambassadors as they had been with Arbogast's. It is clear that for years Theodosius had been arranging things so that his two sons would inherit the empire, and that the elevation of Eugenius was now messing those plans up. But it is also clear that Theodosius was in no position to launch yet another invasion of the West. So the emperor stalled for time. In January of 393, though, Eugenius and Arbogast were finally given an answer, though the presentation of that answer was a bit oblique. In the late 4th century, the ceremonial formality of naming consuls for each year was still hanging around, with both the eastern and western courts naming separate pairs of honorees. In the west, Eugenius named himself to one of the consulships, and Theodosius to the other, a clear indication that he was still seeking an alliance. Theodosius, meanwhile, named himself to a consulship in the east, but gave the other one to some random general, a clear indication that he did not share Eugenius's hopes for an alliance. To set things even deeper in stone, in mid-January, Theodosius elevated his nine-year-old son Honorius to the rank of full Augustus and announced that he intended for the boy to eventually rule the Western Empire. The emperor's other son, Arcadius, now 15 or 16, had himself been elevated to the rank of Augustus back in 383 and was already acknowledged as his father's successor in the east. The elevation of Honorius, though, made it clear that Theodosius had no intention of letting anyone from outside the family into the imperial club, which meant Eugenius could never be recognized officially, which meant that Arbogast was now backing an enemy of the state, which made him an enemy of the state as well. So, unless he wanted to just hand himself over for execution, that meant that Arbogast was going to have to fight for his life. Once again, the empire was on the path to civil war. But it was not a war that either side was prepared to fight just yet. Though the break between East and West became permanent in January 393, it would not be until the summer of 394 that battle would finally be joined. In the meantime, both sides prepared. Eugenius and Arbogast moved their court down to Milan to secure the passes into Italy and make it easier to drum up support from the Roman aristocracy. Bishop Ambrose, far less sure of how he would be treated by Eugenius and Arbogast than he had been about how he was going to be treated by the last usurper to march into Milan, prudently took the opportunity to withdraw to Bologna. Over the course of the next year, he would have further reason to fear the new regime, as Eugenius made a concerted effort to align himself with the pagan aristocracy of Italy. After canceling most of the anti-pagan laws passed by Gratian, Maximus, and Theodosius, Eugenius then granted the long-standing request that the altar of victory be put back in the Senate House, and then provided the funds necessary to reopen the great temple of Venus and Rome. Pagan senators were then appointed to key positions in the government, from which they continued to roll back the ban on paganism, reopening temples all over Italy, and celebrating every holiday, set of games, and festival 
that the old religious calendar demanded. Ambrose chided the emperor for giving in to the devil worshippers, but for the moment he had lost all his influence. For the last time in history, the pagans were ascendant. Back in Constantinople, Theodosius would be able to make much of this pagan takeover in his pre-war propaganda. So much so, that the coming civil war will wind up being painted as a great battle between paganism and Christianity. Indeed, right up until the modern era, the Battle of the Frigidus was presented as the bookend to the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, with Theodosius triumphantly ending the war Constantine had begun 80 years earlier. But focusing on the religious angle of the coming civil war means ignoring the fact that Arbogast and Eugenius' alliance with the pagan senate in Rome was an example of politics making strange bedfellows rather than the logical consummation of some ideological agenda. Both Arbogast and Eugenius were Christian, and they were looking for political recognition and personal survival, not to start a religious revolution. Even the key details of the battle, which we'll get into next week, come to us mostly by way of Christian sources, who were understandably happy to play up the paganism of Theodosius' enemies in order to bathe the emperor in the righteous light of God. But we'll get more into that next week. On a more practical level, Theodosius spent the rest of 393 preparing an army for war, an army that would wind up looking a lot like the army he had taken to face Maximus. The core of the invasion force would be Roman legionaries, but they would once again be matched by an equal number of barbarian auxiliaries. The Goths in particular would play a huge role in the coming fighting, and their forces would be led by a powerful new chief named Alaric. So yes, the sack of Rome is just around the corner. Theodosius' two leading field generals this time around would be a career officer named Timasius and a rising favorite in the eastern court, Stilicho, the Vandal general who had opened negotiations with the Sassanids prior to the war with Maximus. In the intervening years, Stilicho had risen even further in prominence, culminating with his marriage to the emperor's niece-slash-adopted daughter, Serena. Now one of the two or three most powerful men in the empire, Stilicho was put in charge of the preparations for war, and, when the time came, he would be one of the ones leading them in battle. The time for that battle finally came in the summer of 394, as Theodosius and his generals began marching west at the head of an army that at least one source claims was 60,000 men strong, although I should note that for the times, that would have been an enormous army. As they entered Illyria, the first thing Theodosius' army noticed was that the passes into Italy were completely unguarded. Having studied Maximus's failed defense of Italy, Arbogast had concluded that Maximus had erred by dividing up his forces. By stationing troops on both sides of the Alpine passes, Maximus had just made Theodosius's job easier. So Arbogast decided to abandon the eastern entrances into the Alps and concentrate all his forces at the western exits. Theodosius could have the mountains, but when he came down into Italy, he was going to be met by a solid wall. This strategy would prove to be a sound one, and had it not been for a little bad luck, we could very well be talking about the great victory Arbogast won against the overmatched Theodosius. Next week, we'll get into that last great battle between the pagans and the Christians. After the first day of heavy fighting, it will look like Theodosius is done for. But as we'll see, a key defection and a little divine intervention will help turn the tide in the eastern Augustus' favor. But though he would eventually win the day, Theodosius' tactics would wind up having one major unintended consequence, as Alaric and his Goths would leave the field mighty disgruntled. Hello, 
and welcome to the History of Rome. Episode 159, The Divine Winds. Last time, we left off on the eve of a great battle. In the late summer 394, the army of Theodosius entered the Alpine passes, and the army of Arbogast and Eugenius sat a few miles east of Aquileia waiting for them to emerge from the mountains. Today, we'll get into the guts of the battle that is about to ensue, and then get into the guts of what happened next. Since he was just 47 years old, you would think that what happened next was another 15-odd years of solid rule from Theodosius before he handed the reins of power off to his two now-grown and groomed sons. But instead, less than six months after his great victory at the Frigidus River, Theodosius was dead, and the empire was forced to hand the reins of power to the dead emperor still under age and not at all properly groomed sons. With no shortage of powerful and ambitious men more than willing to exploit the deficiencies of the inadequate brother emperors, Theodosius' early demise turned out to be one of the more destabilizing events in an era absolutely rife with destabilizing events. But before we get into that, we must turn our attention to Theodosius' last great triumph, a triumph that will eventually be painted as nothing less than proof that the Christian God was more powerful than all the pagan gods put together. Adding to the notion that the coming battle was some kind of religious showdown, when Arbogast and Eugenius arrived at the spot they had chosen to meet Theodosius, they planted a statue of Jupiter on the field and then affixed images of Hercules to the banners of their troops. With the old gods of Rome watching over them, the army of the west awaited the army of the east. Now whether these details are a later embellishment or not is unknown, but it certainly seems plausible given the vaguely pro-pagan stance Eugenius had adopted for his regime. But, as I said last week, the war between east and west was not about paganism and Christianity. It was about power, pure and simple. I don't think any neutral observer could be blamed for believing that Theodosius was doomed the minute he emerged on the west side of the Alps in early September 394. He popped out into the Frigidus River Valley in modern Slovenia and was immediately greeted by the troubling specter of Arbogast's army. Not only was it troubling that they were there at all, but the highly capable Frankish general had seized every piece of high ground in the valley. Wherever Theodosius looked, he was looking up at Arbogast's soldiers. That alone would have been enough to give any commander a moment's pause. I mean, do I really want to attack an enemy who so completely controls the terrain? We don't know if Theodosius paused, but if he did, it wasn't for very long. The emperor decided that crappy position or no crappy position, he was going to attack. As soon as his men were lined up for battle, the eastern legions launched themselves forward in a full frontal assault. Well, I suppose saying the eastern legions is a bit misleading. Out in front of this initial charge was Alaric and his Goths. Through an ultra-intense day of fighting, the Gothic auxiliaries wound up bearing the brunt of Arbogast's counterattacks, while Theodosius kept the legions proper pulled back in reserve. The casualty rate of the Goths was so high that when the battle was all over, it was said that Theodosius had actually beaten two enemies that day, with Alaric joining Arbogast in defeat. When the dust settled, the Gothic chief and what remained of his men certainly came away thinking that Theodosius was up to slightly more than just trying to defeat Arbogast, and that he had purposefully spilled the blood of the Goths to weaken them politically and militarily. The hard feelings generated by the way they had been used in the battle would last for a generation, winding their way through a brief revolt that we'll get to in a second, and ultimately leading to the stunning, if not exactly strategically important, sack of Rome 15 years later. The first day of the battle ended without a decisive victory for either side, but it was obvious to everyone on both sides that Arbogast was getting the better of Theodosius. In the camp of the Western Army, spirits were high, and everyone was under the impression that victory was just a good night's sleep away. On the other side, in the camp of the Eastern Army, morale was non-existent. They were just a bunch of men sitting around waiting to die. Even Theodosius despaired at his chances, and he spent the evening in prayer, 
attempting to gin up some sort of miracle that would salvage his chances. And given everything that's about to happen, it's fairly easy to see why later chronicles might play this up and report that God decided to answer Theodosius' prayers. The first little turn of fortune came during the night. Arbogast still commanded the high ground of the battlefield, but the passes that the eastern legions had emerged from were still wide open, and the Frankish general was concerned that Theodosius would get it into his head to retreat rather than stay and fight. So he ordered a strong detachment of soldiers to march around Theodosius' camp and occupy the entrances. Bottled up and broken, Theodosius would most likely offer his surrender by lunchtime the following day. But the commander of this detachment knew an opportunity when he saw it, and when he got into position, he sent word down to Theodosius saying that he'd be happy to defect if the price was right. Since the Eastern Augustus was basically facing his own imminent death, the commander could pretty much name what that right price was, which he did, which Theodosius immediately agreed to pay. The detachment defected, the passes remained open, and Theodosius' army gained some much-needed reinforcements. The second and more famous turn of fortune came the next day after the two sides had resumed their fighting. The only problem is that there are no guarantees that it actually happened the way that later historians claim that it happened. It's eminently plausible, but since the specific details that have been passed down to us didn't start cropping up until years later, it is entirely possible that the whole incident is just a figment of some overzealous church historian's imagination as a way to graphically depict how God had stepped into the fighting on Theodosius' side. See, there is this weather phenomenon that lurks around the eastern Alps called the Bora, hugely intense windstorms that have been known to gust with the strength of a low-grade hurricane. On the second day of battle, one of these windstorms kicked up, and wouldn't you know it, it blew directly into the face of Arbogast's army. As the two sides approached each other, the western army was rendered practically blind by the dusty winds blowing directly in their face. The eastern army, on the other hand, had the winds at their back, and so advanced completely unaffected. It is written that the winds eventually became so strong that the spears lobbed at Theodosius' army were blown back at the very men who had thrown them, and that the arrows fired were shot back at the very men who had fired them. Arbogast's army, so close to victory the night before, quickly fell apart in the face of the torrential wind. By the end of the second day, the army of the west was broken, and those who could not flee were captured. Theodosius had snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. Could it be anything less than divine intervention? Among those captured was Eugenius. The would-be emperor was brought before Theodosius, whereupon he nobly dropped to his knees and began begging for his life. Though Theodosius was typically magnanimous in victory, this magnanimity had its limits, and self-proclaimed emperors received no quarter. Eugenius was executed, and his head was put on display for all to see. Arbogast, meanwhile, managed to escape from the battle unharmed, but after spending a few days in the hills dodging patrols like some common criminal, he concluded that it was high time that he took the honorable path out of his predicament, and he committed suicide before he could be captured. The deaths of Eugenius and Arbogast meant that for the moment at least, across the whole expanse of the Roman Empire, from Spain to Syria and from Africa to Britain, no one opposed Theodosius' sole rule. For a few months in late 394 A.D., Theodosius stood as the only emperor in the Roman Empire. He would be the last man to hold that distinction. Just as he had done following the victory over Maximus, Theodosius completed his march by entering Milan and setting up court in the Italian capital. There was much to be done and much to grapple with, and Theodosius knew he was going to have his work cut out for him. The war with Eugenius and Arbogast had been even bloodier than the war with Maximus, which hurt doubly since the legions had not really gotten back to full strength since that last civil war. Both the Rhine and Danube frontiers were now dangerously under-garrisoned. On top of his military woes, Theodosius also knew he was going to have to deal with the headache of rolling back the pagan tide that had risen in his absence. 
committed more than ever to his Nicene Catholicism following the miracle of victory at the Frigidus, Theodosius began to undo the religious damage done by the pagan aristocracy of Rome. It was at this point that the altar of victory disappears from the historical record, never to be heard from again. So, quit asking me to put it back in the Senate House. It's gone, so get over it. Since Theodosius' historic place as the last sole ruler of the Roman Empire is often listed near the very top of his imperial resume, you might be inclined to think that he held this distinction for a few years. I mean, at least a year. But not so. The correct answer is four months. All that stuff that Theodosius knew he was going to have to deal with wound up getting dealt with by someone else. Because in mid-January, the emperor came down with what historians label as a nasty bout of edema. Doctors were called and everyone prayed, but it all did no good. On the 17th of January, 395 AD, Theodosius died. He was 48 years old and had been an Augustus for 16 years. Did I mention that he was the last sole ruler of the Roman Empire? Theodosius was an enormously influential ruler, and though I don't think he cracks into that upper tier of truly great emperors, there is no getting around the fact that the history of the world runs right through his reign. Obviously, his staunch Catholicism and eventual staunch anti-paganism spelled the end of the old religions of antiquity. Monotheism was here to stay. Christianity was now the religion of the empire. But beyond the official public policies, Theodosius' own personal piety allowed the Western Church, in the form of Bishop Ambrose, to establish once and for all a degree of autonomy from the secular ruling class, and even a degree of power over it. As I mentioned previously, the next thousand years of political philosophy will revolve around the relationship between church and state, and I'm not sure that debate even gets started if Theodosius refuses to yield to Ambrose in the months after the massacre at Thessalonica. But the emperor's religion was not a PR stunt. His Christian beliefs were heartfelt, and he took Ambrose's threats to his soul seriously. So, Theodosius did what the bishop demanded he do, and in the process set a precedent that later kings and popes would follow. Finally, given that he did play such a major role in the final entrenchment of Christianity, which I think we can all agree is a pretty big deal, the major role Theodosius played in ensuring the empire did not collapse following Adrianople is sometimes lost in the shuffle. But that, too, was a pretty big deal. His ability to recognize the stark reality of the empire's situation, that they could not risk another battle, that they must deal with the Goths diplomatically, is perhaps even more important to the history of the world than his religious policies. Because had he blown it in the dark days after Adrianople, there might not have been an empire left to Christianize. That said, allowing the undefeated Goths to settle in Roman territory and essentially live under their own laws would have profound negative consequences down the road. It is, after all, another one of the 257 different reasons why the Western Empire fell apart. But we'll get into all that a bit down the road. For now, though, we must turn to Theodosius's more immediate legacy. Namely, that his untimely death meant that control of the empire fell into the hands of a 16-year-old and an 11-year-old, neither of whom were well-trained in the military arts, had any real experience with statecraft, or, if you believe the pronouncements of most modern scholars, were particularly bright individuals. Sadly, for the good people of the Roman Empire, their emperors Arcadius and Honorius turned out to be a couple of underage, dim bulbs, who were so easily manipulated and pushed around that their reigns were defined most especially by the revolving door of ambitious advisors who were constantly cutting each other's throats in order to take their turn being the real power behind the throne. Without anything resembling a firm hand on the tiller, power-hungry ministers and generals began to run amok, fatally undermining the political solidarity that the empire so desperately needed at the dawn of the 5th century. The first two of those power-hungry ministers stepped to the plate upon the death of Theodosius in January 395, 
And of course, since political solidarity was so vitally important at the dawn of the 5th century, it was perfect that they were personal enemies, who were more than willing to extend their rivalries into official state policy. Awesome. The first of these ministers was Stilicho, the Vandal general who had risen to become Theodosius' son-in-law and the leader of the Eastern Army. The other was the Praetorian prefect Rufinus, who had been left in charge of Constantinople when that eastern army had marched west. Arcadius and Honorius had both been left in Rufinus's care when their father had marched off to face down Eugenius and Arbogast, but when Theodosius became deathly ill, Honorius was called to Milan in case he needed to assume the mantle of western Augustus. Aware that his time was drawing near, Theodosius began scrambling to get some sort of succession plan in place, and he naturally turned to Stilicho to ensure that things wouldn't go to hell the minute he died. Pretty soon, everyone got word that when the emperor did die, that Stilicho would act as a de facto regent for the underage Honorius. Given the general's familial connection to Theodosius, this came as a surprise to no one. But then came the curveball. Just before he died, Theodosius dismissed all his other ministers so he could have a private chat with Stilicho. During this chat, Theodosius told his son-in-law that he wanted Stilicho to act as a guardian not just of Honorius, but of Arcadius as well. This deathbed request effectively became the emperor's last words, as he died almost immediately after this secret conversation. But you can probably see the problem here. Stilicho was the only one present for this momentous pronouncement. Everyone assumed the Vandal general was going to rule the West, and everyone was fine with that. But now suddenly, he was wandering around telling people that Theodosius secretly told him at the last minute that he was supposed to rule the East, too. To which I would have reacted, you don't actually expect me to believe that obvious load of complete BS, do you? But Stilicho apparently did expect everyone to believe it. And for almost the entire time he was in power, he maintained his rather bizarre claim to regency over the whole empire. To top it all off, modern historians are not even convinced that there ever was a secret conversation, that the whole thing had been made up out of whole cloth after the fact to explain Stilicho's attempt to seize control of the Eastern Empire. Probably the person laughing hardest at Stilicho's obvious load of complete BS was back in Constantinople, the Praetorian prefect Rufinus. As I mentioned, he and Stilicho were bitter enemies, so you can probably imagine his reaction when a messenger arrived one day bearing the news that Stilicho was claiming Theodosius secretly wanted him to control the Eastern Empire. I picture Rufinus falling out of his chair laughing, picking himself up off the floor, and then immediately making plans to kill Stilicho at the earliest opportunity. But Stilicho would prove himself to be an extremely savvy operator, far savvier than Rufinus anyway, who will, incidentally, wind up dead in a ditch in less than a year. Eager to solidify his position as the new de facto regent, and I say de facto because there was no official regent position in Roman law, He turned to the most powerful man in the Western Empire, Ambrose of Milan, for support. The Vandal general and the Roman bishop forged an alliance that was sealed when Ambrose publicly endorsed the claim that Stilicho had been ordered to preside over both imperial brothers, rather than just Honorius. But Rufinus was undeterred. Stilicho could make all the laughable claims he wanted. There was no way the Praetorian prefect was giving an inch of political space. This test of wills came to a head in 395, in an incident that put on full display the consequences of personal rivalry spilling over into official policy. As I've mentioned, the Goths were not at all happy about the way they had been used at the Battle of the Frigidus, and it was an article of faith among them that they had been intentionally led to the slaughter to weaken their power. Initially, Alaric, the leading chief of the Gothic army, neither stoked these fires nor did anything really to dampen them out. He was more reserved than his countrymen because with all the reshuffling that was underway following the death of Theodosius, he thought he saw an opportunity to follow in the footsteps of Ricamir and Arbogast and Stilicho and become a barbarian general in the Roman army. 
But Stilicho in particular was hugely opposed to the idea of Alaric serving Rome in an official capacity, mostly because combining the role of Gothic king with Roman general was a frightening prospect. Alaric led his troops back to Thrace in the spring of 395, but when he got there, he received word that he was not, in fact, going to be offered a command. And so, feeling betrayed, he started actively encouraging the Goths' hostility. In just a few weeks, their rage boiled over, and the Central Empire was once again dealing with a marauding Gothic army. Since the Romans had just fought a big old civil war in northern Italy, that's where most of the troops of the empire were at the moment, and so it fell to Stilicho to deal with Alaric's rampaging Goths. But the army Stilicho led through the Alps was not really in tip-top shape, nor a particularly cohesive unit. The damage done at the Frigidus was still being felt, not just in terms of physical fighting ability, but also in terms of the troops actually trusting each other. After all, the men who made up Stilicho's army had just been hacking each other to pieces the previous autumn. It was a little difficult for them to grasp that they were all now on the same side. But there was no getting around the fact that the Goths needed to be settled, so off Stilicho went to try to settle them. The Vandal was a deft general, and knowing the weakness of his own army, decided to engage in a positional campaign designed to hem Alaric in, rather than trying to break him in a set-piece battle. Eventually, Stilicho's strategy proved so successful that the Goths became trapped in a terrible position. If Stilicho was ever going to take a shot at battle, now would be the time to do it. But then a surprise order came in from Arcadius, originating, of course, with Rufinus, demanding that Stilicho return the eastern troops to Constantinople and withdraw from Greece at once. That Stilicho decided to comply with this order hints that he maybe had no intention of actually attacking the Goths, but he sure told everyone who would listen that he had been fatally undercut by that sneaky snake Rufinus, who had robbed the Romans of a certain victory simply to deny me, noble Stilicho, a personal victory. Whoever's idea it was to let Alaric go, and there is good evidence that it was indeed Stilicho's idea, the fact that the Gothic chief lived to fight another day wound up having some pretty serious consequences down the road. Next week, we will begin to feel some of those consequences, as the empire will break down into three political centers of gravity, Stilicho in the west, Alaric in the center, and whoever happened to be controlling Arcadius at the moment in the east. Over the next few years, they will all play everyone off everyone else in a tricky and often bloody game of political chess that will wind up leaving the Empire with very few pieces left on the board. And welcome to the History of Rome, Episode 160, East versus West. In the summer of 395, Astilico led practically the only Roman army of consequence left in the empire into Thrace to face down Alaric and his rampaging Goths. But right at the moment when it appeared that victory was within his grasp, Astilico suddenly decided to detach the eastern contingent of his army and return it to Constantinople before leading the rest of his army back towards the west. Preparing to make his last stand, Alaric wound up simply watching the Roman army dissipate without so much as a sword being drawn. Scholars long blamed the machinations of the eastern Praetorian prefect Rufinus for the order to break up Stilicho's army, but it is just as likely that Stilicho himself never had any intention of bringing Alaric to battle, and was just happy for any excuse to withdraw. As later events would show, as much as imperial propaganda liked to paint the Goths as out-of-control monsters, the courts of both East and West knew 
that they were actually an incredibly valuable military resource to be utilized, not some terrible foreign enemy to be defeated at all costs. Put simply, crushing the Goths would have meant crippling the long-term war-making power of the empire. And beyond that, the courts of East and West also understood that crushing the Goths would have meant losing a potential ace in the hole to be laid down in the high-stakes game of political poker they were playing with each other. Aside from long-term geopolitical strategy, Stilicho had another incentive for breaking up his army. Whether he was the instigator of the coming assassination of Rufinus or just an interested third party is unknown, but it is hard to believe Stilicho didn't know what was going to happen when the eastern troops returned to Constantinople. Heading back east under the command of an ethnically goth general named Gainus, the troops arrived at the great capital city in the late summer of 395. The emperor Arcadius came out to the army's camp to greet them, and the prefect Rufinus was by his side. But when they arrived, a hand-picked company of soldiers surrounded the shocked prefect and unceremoniously hacked him to death. Rufinus had apparently been so focused on his enemy Stilicho that he failed to see just how many enemies he was generating right there at home, not the least of whom was the new empress, Eudoxia. It's not that Rufinus didn't know Eudoxia was a deadly rival for power. After all, her marriage to Arcadius earlier that April had been publicly opposed by the prefect, as he had been pushing his own daughter on the emperor. And you can't really stand in the way of a woman's path to power and then expect roses and thank you cards when she slips past you into the emperor's bedroom. Eudoxia quickly got together with one of Rufinus's court enemies, a eunuch named Eutropius, and together they conspired to topple the prefect, all likely with Stilicho's nod and wink, if not outright support. But if Stilicho was thinking that the fall of Rufinus would lead the eastern court to recognize his claim to regency over Constantinople, well, then he was let down. Eutropius and Eudoxia simply stepped into the power vacuum left by the prefect and controlled Arcadius for their own purposes, rebuffing all of Stilicho's political advances. Shut out once again from the east, in 396, Stilicho turned his attention to his own backyard to ensure its stability when he inevitably went back across the Alps to confront Alaric. The rise of Eutropius and Eudoxia as enemies of the Vandal general meant that the Goths needed to be brought into Stilicho's sphere and fast. Alaric must not be allowed to sign a peace deal with Constantinople. He must be brought to heel by the West, and if not converted into an active ally, then at least sidelined for any intra-imperial struggle. Stilicho's biggest fear, of course, was a vaguely noble one. He feared that Constantinople would give the Gothic king the Roman generalship that he had been craving as the price for an alliance, a price that Stilicho thought way too high and way too dangerous to the long-term health of the empire. Having ethnically barbarian generals was fine, after all, he was one, but having one who doubled as the king of a barbarian nation, well, the implications of that conflict of interest were just too terrifying to contemplate. So Stilicho spent 396 marching up and down the Rhine, making deals with the Germans to get them to sit tight, raising new recruits and extra cash along the way. While Stilicho was thus occupied, Alaric continued to plunder the central empire more or less at will. Not that he was on some hell-bent for leather trip. He too was looking for a political arrangement rather than a military victory, so as plundering campaigns went, it was actually pretty mild, and cities were of course more than welcome to pay their way out of any potential sacking. Eutropius, for his part, just sort of let Alaric run because he too was looking to strike a deal and didn't want to make enemies with the man he was trying to make his ally. It's also written a few places that the Huns were starting to make trouble near Syria, so it's entirely possible that even had he wanted to, Eutropius would have been unable to muster the resources to do anything about Alaric. In 397, though, Stilicho felt like he was ready to do something about Alaric. So he gathered up an army, partially composed of veterans and partially composed of new recruits, and sailed them over to Corinth. This was a gutsy move for the Vandal general, as Greece clearly belonged to Constantinople. 
to up and land an army there without permission could easily be seen as an act of war. And in case you're wondering, no, Stilicho did not have permission to up and land an army there. But he did have a moral argument that someone had to do something about the Goths. And are we not one united empire? So he landed his army and began to wage war on Alaric. But as with his campaign in 395, it was a war of positional maneuvering rather than open field battling. Alaric marched here, Stilicho marched there. Alaric marched there, Stilicho marched here. The Vandal general's objective was to checkmate Alaric, not destroy him. But again, as with the campaign of 395, Stilicho would be forced to break off his offensive before even checkmate could be achieved. There is no explicit reason given for Stilicho's decision to withdraw from Greece, and speculation ranges from the general believing that his new troops might not be a match for the Goths should it come down to a battle, to the fact that Eutropius had Stilicho declared a public enemy for waging this unsanctioned war, which undercut the political rationale for the campaign. But I have always suspected that the situation in North Africa might have been a major catalyst. Ah, what situation in North Africa, you ask? I'll get to that in a second. But before we move on, I should note that this was the second time that Stilicho will have Alaric on the run and fail to finish the job. It will also not be the last time. And eventually, the gossipy backstabbers in Milan will start to wonder if the barbarian general running their army maybe doesn't have Rome's best interests at heart and was instead looking to form some pan-barbarian alliance that would someday conquer Rome, either from within or from without. Far-fetched and paranoid? Perhaps. But why else would Stilicho keep letting Alaric get away? The situation in North Africa was that in mid-397, a revolt against Milan had broken out led by the local governor, and likely instigated by Eutropius. The governor, a man named Gildo, is an interesting character, and it's kind of a shame I haven't gotten to him until just now, because I'm about to kill him off. Gildo was of Berber descent, and had been a close associate of the Theodosian family, serving the elder Theodosius loyally during the campaign against Firmus. As a reward for this loyalty, the younger Theodosius promoted Gildo up the ranks until by 386 the Berber general was more or less in charge of the entire North African coast, not counting Egypt, of course. With the consent of Theodosius, for the next decade Gildo served as a nearly autonomous dictator of Africa, whose principal assignment was maintaining the all-important grain shipments bound for Italy. He ruthlessly and effectively carried out his assignment and so he was left alone. But when his patron Theodosius died, Gildo's loyalties and motives became far less clear. Technically, he was a part of the Western Empire and subject to the court of Milan. But he had been on his own for so long that Stilicho viewed him with suspicion, and Eutropius viewed him with hope. In mid-397, Gildo allowed himself to be swayed by Eutropius, and he pledged his loyalty to Arcadius and the court of Constantinople. This shift in the political gravity of the empire came so hot on the heels of Stilicho's withdrawal from Greece that I wonder, but I have no evidence to support this bit of speculation, whether Gildo's imminent side-switching wasn't known privately before it was announced publicly. In any case, it sure was lucky that Stilicho and his army were back in Italy right at the moment when they needed to head south to defend Milan's claim to the grain shipments, which Gildo had begun to withhold. Stilicho sprang into action when the grain stopped coming, because he knew that any disruption to the food supplies would have been devastating to his political legitimacy, especially since earlier that year he had lost his most important political ally. In April of 397, at the age of 58, Ambrose of Milan had died. Ambrose had been the bishop of the Italian capital for 23 years and is justly recognized not just as one of the most influential men in the history of the Catholic Church, which he obviously was, but also as one of the most influential men in the history of the world, period. 
He provided a continuity of leadership through an age during which no fewer than six different men laid claim to the imperial throne of Milan. And so it was he, way more than they, who really came to define that age and the future trajectory of both the church and the state. To say nothing of the fact that back in 386, he had personally converted a 30-something-year-old religious seeker named Augustine to Christianity, which is why I hold Ambrose personally responsible for all those times I had to read select portions of the City of God for the test on Friday. Stilicho spent the rest of 397 and the early part of 398 scrambling to deal with the loss of the African grain, and, showing off his administrative acumen, he was largely successful in the effort, bringing down supplies from Gaul to make up for the shortfall. This was only a temporary solution, but it was enough of a solution that far from toppling the Vandal general, his prestige was actually elevated and he became stronger than ever. So strong, in fact, that he was able to push through the marriage of his daughter to the now 14-year-old Honorius, meaning that Stilicho was now not just the guardian of the emperor, but also his father-in-law, which also meant that down the road, he was going to be the grandfather of any and all imperial heirs. But as strong as his standing was right at that moment, Stilicho knew it would all be pulled right out from under him if he failed to turn back on the North African grain shipments. In the spring of 398, then, Stilicho ordered an invasion force to head south, topple Gildo, and retake the farms and ports of the region. The Vandal general did not lead this force personally, but instead left it in the hands of a commander Stilicho knew would pursue the destruction of Gildo with a relentless zeal, Gildo's brother and now mortal enemy, Mezcazel. The two brothers had once been as close as you'd expect brothers to be, but they had had a falling out, and Mezcazel, fearing for his life, had fled North Africa for the safety of Italy. As punishment for the flight, Gildo took the rather extreme step of executing Mezcazel's two sons. So Stilicho recognized that if there was one man in the empire who was not going to rest until Gildo's head was on a stick, it was Mezcazel. So he gave the Berber general command of the invasion force and left it to him to interpret the vague orders to retake North Africa, however he saw fit. Mezcazel's forces landed in Africa, and though they were outnumbered by the army that greeted them, Gildo's forces crumpled almost immediately. The ease of Mezcazel's victory has been explained variously as the result of his own troops being far superior in discipline and skill. After all, the North African brigades never face the kind of threats faced daily by their northern comrades, or possibly as the result of bribes from Mezcazel who knew that his brother's ruthless tendencies had not endeared him to many over the years. Probably, it was a little from column A and a little from column B. Gildo immediately recognized that the jig was up, and that making a run for Constantinople was his only chance at survival. Mezcazel was obviously not going to be lenient in his victory. But as Gildo's ship set sail for the east, a storm kicked up, and blew the boat back ashore. Washed up and recognized, Gildo was thrown into chains by some local magistrates looking to make a good impression on Mezcazel. But before his brother could get to him, Gildo was able to commit suicide. Though he had succeeded in his mission far faster than anyone could have predicted, I'd be willing to bet that Mezcazel himself was mostly just bitter about the outcome of the invasion, since he had not been able to kill Gildo with his own bare hands. But he did not have long to stew in his bitterness. Recalled to Milan, Mezcazel was greeted by the population as a hero. But a few weeks later, he and Stilicho went out for a stroll, and while crossing a bridge, poor Mezcazel lost his footing and plunged off the bridge to his death. Stilicho swore up and down that it was an accident, but it's really, really hard not to conclude that having successfully used the Berber to retake Africa, that Stilicho did away with Mezcazel before his power and popularity grew to rival Stilicho's. These were dangerous times, and the stakes were high. But Stilicho swore it was an accident, and what are you going to do? Argue with the father-in-law of the emperor? 
With his North African gambit having come to nothing, back in Constantinople, Eutropius returned to the other major political and military power that could be possibly used as leverage against Stilicho, Alaric, and his Goths. Eutropius decided that the time had finally come to give the Gothic king what he wanted, an official command in the Eastern Roman army, which had the further effect of essentially deputizing the Gothic warriors into said Eastern Roman army, which was partly the point of Alaric wanting the command in the first place. He had been angling for the command for two main reasons. First, it meant that his people were now hooked into the official imperial supply lines, so rather than having to go through the rigor morale of plundering, the Goths could now kick back and wait for regular shipments of food and supplies. Second, it meant that Alaric would now have access to the inner circle of Roman military planning and execution, and as long as he was in the room, nothing like the exploitation of the Goths that had happened at the Frigidus River would ever happen again. Alaric standing with his own people was at an all-time high, and though he was now technically subject to Arcadius, and by extension Eutropius, in practice he was subject to no one at all. As great as this all was for Alaric, however, the deal wound up sowing the seeds of Eutropius's demise. There were more than a few people in the empire who were not at all happy about the deal, especially the people who had just been terrorized by the Goths and who were now obligated to supply them in perpetuity. Maybe Eutropius could have weathered that political storm, but later in 398, he proceeded to make another key mistake that wound up pushing his career completely off the rails. A branch of the Huns had apparently gotten a little too friendly with the Roman front lines, and it became clear that they would have to be pushed back. But rather than assign one of his generals to see to that pushing back, Eutropius decided to take command for himself. Which, remember please, that Eutropius is a eunuch, with all the prejudicial baggage that, that status entails. Secretly running the empire as a high-ranking court official was one thing. That's the sort of thing you'd expect a eunuch to be up to. But leading troops in battle? Well, that was hugely offensive to conservative Roman sensibilities. The worst part of it, though, came later, when Eutropius's command proved to be entirely successful. Rather than take to the shadows like a eunuch should, Eutropius boldly stepped forward, took credit for the victory, and paraded himself around Constantinople in triumph. And then came the final affront. In January 399, Eutropius had himself named one of the consuls for the year. This was simply too much for most people to handle. Eunuchs were not consuls. Period. End of story. But Eutropius's hubris had gotten the better of him, and he simply assumed that he was untouchable. He was not. The exact sequence of events that wound up toppling Eutropius began in the spring of 399. Some Gothic auxiliaries who had been settled in Asia Minor began to complain that Eutropius had not delivered on promises made during the previous year's campaign against the Huns, and when they decided their complaints were falling on deaf ears, they picked up their swords to see if maybe Constantinople would listen to that. Eutropius did indeed listen, but instead of delivering on his promises, he sent some troops under the command of the Gothic general Gainus, who we met earlier at the assassination of Rufinus, to put down the burgeoning revolt. But Gainus, being ethnically Goth, sympathized with the leaders of the revolt, and did not try very hard to put them down. Instead, he opened up talks with them, not revolving on how to resettle them, but revolving around what was to be done with the eunuch. Meanwhile, in Constantinople, a backroom campaign to oust the arrogant Eutropius began to unfold, matching the talks that were going on out in the field. Spearheaded by a minister named Aurelian, the campaign eventually received the blessing and then the backing of the Empress Eudoxia, who had begun to feud with Eutropius now that he was getting too big for his britches. In mid-399, Eutropius opened up a dispatch from Gainus, and instead of reading about how the rabble had been defeated, he instead read about how the two sides had united in demanding Eutropius step down from office. This ultimatum 
It was the cue for Aurelian's conspiracy to spring into action and destroy Eutropius' political credibility with the emperor, and with Eudoxia on board, they were able to quickly isolate the eunuch. Eutropius' four years in power were over, and he was either exiled or executed, depending on which source you believe. But the coalition to eliminate Eutropius turned on itself the minute it succeeded. Aurelian had been a convenient ally for Gainus as long as they shared the same enemy. But the minister was long suspected of having anti-army biases, and as soon as Eutropius was out of the picture, the Gothic general turned the leverage he held as the most powerful general in the East against his one-time ally. Which is to say that Aurelian disappears from the historical record almost as suddenly as he had appeared in the first place. As the 5th century dawned then, the Eastern Empire was essentially run by Eudoxia in the palace and Gainus out in the field. Arcadius, now 23 years old, was nowhere to be seen, as indifferent as he likely was incompetent. In the West, Stilicho continued to run the show for Honorius, who was no better than his older brother, and in the middle was Alaric and his Goths, now an officially sanctioned arm of the Eastern Roman army. Next week, Stilicho will continue to outlast his enemies in the east, as Gainus will fall almost as fast as he had risen. Stilicho will also continue his on-again, off-again wars with the Goths, who will pretty soon get it into their heads to invade Italy, but as had happened twice before, Alaric will once again escape Stilicho's clutches. And it was the rumors of barbarian collusion, as much as anything else, that will eventually see the Vandal general finally toppled from power.